Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Black Literature, Black History. This is Jason Williams, and tonight we're going to continue with Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl by Harriet Jacobs. We're going to do a few more chapters in this book before actually leaving this book and moving on. But this is a very important chapter, I feel. It's uh, chapter 13 called The Church and Slavery that everyone should read and pay close attention to because there are a few things that Harriet Jacobs covers in this chapter that gives us insight into how the slaves view church and also how the slave masters view church and how um, white preachers taught in, in these churches on the plantation. Now, it's very interesting that Harriet Jacobs begins the chapter with this opening. After the alarm caused by Nat Turner's insurrection had subsided, the slaveholders came to the conclusion that it would be well to give the slaves enough of religious instruction to keep them from murdering their masters. Now, reading this chapter, you'll see that the slaves were not misled by slave masters in their instruction of the of the Bible. It is true that the slave masters twisted the words of the Bible, gave false interpretations of the Bible to reinforce slavery. But the reason why I say that the slaves weren't misled is because the slaves were conscious of what the slave masters were doing. When you hear black people condemning Christians nowadays, talking about that's the white man's religion, etc., etc., it's not like that's some type of new teaching or some new type of consciousness. If you read this chapter, Harriet Jacobs is 100% conscious that these slave masters were using the Bible to, within an attempt to calm the slaves down. And of course, during this time period, just like you do today, you have black people who are unconscious of what's going on, uh, very ignorant, and are misled by the Bible, forgiving everybody for all wrongs that they do to them. But that's but this uh, notion that that black people didn't don't know what's going on and didn't know that they were being miseducated as far as the Bible goes. That's not that's not a new doctrine. However, knowing this, Harriet Jacobs, she did not dismiss the teachings of the Bible. She participated in the sermons, even the sermons that were conducted by corrupt pastors, because she knew how to read. And she didn't want to leave the ignorant slaves or those slaves who did not know how to read just out to, to be misled. She would attend meetings at nighttime because she, she said she would go out at night. Because if you listen to my other chapters that Dr. Flint was always on her heels, always pestering her. So she used to go out at night and attend sermons 
and read the Bible. And she actually taught an elder in this chapter how to read the Bible because back then the Bible was not only a tool for uh, to practice the Christian religion, many slaves used the Bible to learn how to read. And that is why I believe many of these slave narratives are very well written because I remember when I was learning how to read, I was reading books like Matt, Meat, Mitt, and Mitt, Meat, Matt, and Sea Spot Run, which is very elementary. But you have to admit that if you learn how to read by following what is written in the Bible, you would be very eloquent and very advanced in your reading skills by the time you got to the end of the Bible. Because regardless of what you feel about the Bible, you cannot argue that it is very well written very poetic form of writing. But back to this, the church and slavery. Harriet Jacobs, along with other slave narratives and including Frederick Douglass's narrative, she does acknowledge that when her slave Master Dr. Flint became religious, and many of the other so called religious slave masters were the worst slave masters. They feigned to be religious men in order to justify their brutality and cruelty to their slaves because many of the slave masters teaching these false doctrines actually believed in what they were teaching. So they would place themselves as gods or as masters per religious ordination or ordained as masters and carry out various punishments to the slaves if they were disobeyed and then justify it by finding verses in the Bible saying, if you don't follow your leader, you are to be punished. Now in this chapter, Harry Jacobs actually spends an entire page reciting one of the sermons that uh, Mr. Pike he was the, the preacher, one of his sermons, and what he was saying to try and get the slaves in line to quell rebellions. And she also goes on to give verses of the uh, hymns and songs that the slaves Creative. She said that they would they would create their own songs and hymns, and it's very insightful. Where she she tells us what the slaves are singing about. Now I'm going to jump to the end of the chapter to make where she makes this point where. She was arguing with Dr. Flint about religion and he was telling her that she needs to join the church and she said there's enough sinners in the church already and if I could be allowed to live like a Christian, I should be glad. And then she told Dr. Flint that and then he said to her, you can do what I require, and if you are faithful to me, 
You will be as virtuous as my wife. He replied, I answered that the Bible didn't say so. His voice became hoarse with rage. How dare you preach to me about your infernal Bible, he exclaimed. What right have you, who are my Negro, to talk to me about what you would like and what you wouldn't like? I am your master and you shall obey me. And then Harriet Jacobs addresses us, the readers. No wonder the slaves sing. Oh, Satan's church is here below. Up to God's free church, I hope to go. So these, the slaves were very conscious about the slave masters hiring uh, because they did pay preachers to teach, you know, false interpretations of the Bible. However, Harriet Jacobs also comments on some preachers who literally taught the word and told the slaves that they are to be judged by their character, not their skin color. And many preachers got run off plantations, got harassed and rejected by white people when they did teach to the slaves that they are human beings. Now, which brings me to another point. You would ask why would the slaves attend the church if they knew that they were being taught false doctrines? Well, even though they were being taught false doctrines by the white preachers, church was still a place where they could all come together. They did share their stories and sufferings with one another, even though the preacher, the white preachers didn't appreciate many times these testimonies. But Harriet Jacobs said that this being so, church was one of the only places where slaves were actually being treated as human beings. You know, out on the plantation, they're ordered around, they're beaten and whipped and cursed and treated like cattle, shadow slavery. But during church, they were being taught something and they were being treated as human beings, and they were in the company of one another. And she actually says, precious are such moments to the poor slaves. If you were to hear them at such times, you might think that they were happy, but can that hour of singing and shouting sustain them through the dreary week toiling without wages under constant dread of the lash. And that, you know, that's a very a telling paragraph, very well written. Like I said in previous videos, if you read some of Harriet Jacobs' paragraphs out loud, you see that they're very uh, eloquent and very good prose. So, um, now she talked about one of the slaves, or one of the preachers, who she said was an honest preacher, and she talked about his wife, and this led me to just question what I, what I always ask, and I, I addressed this in my in my video where I read my slave papers, the slave papers in my family, where upon death, the slave master freed my ancestor. In that instance, it was three years after the death based on 
good behavior. But in this chapter, she talks about the white preacher's wife died. And upon her death, she says, and I want to read it. She said, I have tried to do you good and promote your happiness. And if I have failed, it has not been for want of interest in your welfare. Do not weep for me, but prepare for the new duties that lie before you. I leave you all free. May we meet in a better world. Now, throughout this book, Harriet Jacobs very eloquently writes what people supposedly have said, and I just can't believe that many of these slave masters and some of the slaves spoke so eloquently, especially as they're dying. But, the, but what I question is, that I don't understand how these slave masters free their slaves upon their death and believe that they're doing something virtuous. I just don't understand that. If you really believe that your slaves should be free, you should free them as soon as you buy them. You should buy slaves to free them. Kind of like in the mo at the end of the movie, a Schindler's List, where the guy was buying as many Jewish people as he could to set them free from the Holocaust. If these slave masters that free their slaves upon their death believe that these slaves should be free, they should free them while they're alive. It seems to me that they're being selfish. Like you're my slave, so I'm going to keep you, but when I die, I don't want anybody else to have you. So I, just, I don't understand the psychology behind freeing these slaves after you die. That just doesn't make sense to me. So something else that was that she pointed out was the slave masters using the church and religion to to show northerners and others who don't have slaves on their plantations a false sense of the slaves being happy You know, they show the slaves in church. They show them singing hymns and the people walk around the plantation and they ask questions of the slaves. And of course, the slaves lie and say that they're being treated well and that they're learning religion and everything is fine because they know that if they tell the truth, they will get the tar beat out of them. And... Harriet Jacobs addresses this. A clergyman who goes to the South for the first time has usually some feeling, however vague, that slavery is wrong. The slaveholder suspects this and plays his game accordingly. He makes himself as agreeable as possible, talks on theology and other kindred topics. The reverend gentleman is asked to invoke a blessing on the table loaded with luxuries. After dinner, he walks around the premises and sees the beautiful groves and flowering vines and the comfortable huts of favored household slaves. The southerner invites him to talk with these slaves. He asks them if they want to be free, and they say, Oh, no, Master. This is sufficient to satisfy him. He comes home to publish a South Side view of slavery 
and to complain of the exaggerations of abolitionists. He assures people that he has been to the South and has seen slavery for himself, that it is a beautiful, patriarchal institution, that slaves don't want their freedom, that they have hallelujah meetings and other religious privileges. Then she goes on to say, what does he know of the half-starved wretches toiling from dawn till dark on the plantations? Of mothers shrieking for their children torn from their arms by slave traders? Of young girls dragged down into moral filth? Of pools of blood around the whipping post? Of hounds trained to tear human flesh? of men screwed into cotton gins to die. The slaveholder showed him none of these things, and the slaves dared not tell of them if he had asked them. There is a great difference between Christianity and religion at the South. So this is the purpose of the slave narrative, to give us insight and during the time period to give America insights of the horrors and trickery going on in the slave plantations in the South. So Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl by Harriet Jacobs. And she also references uh, Nat Turner again in this chapter and going forward I'm just noticing that there's a chapter on the fugitive slave law now in the previous video I read the one of the fugitive slave laws one of the first ones and there's actually another fugitive slave law closer to this time period when this book was written that she is actually referencing. But I just wanted to, to just give you listeners and viewers you know, a view of how, of how these fugitive slave laws were written and what they entailed. And when you do your own research, you'll see the connotations and and uh, views that people had on these fugitive slave laws. So I may do two more uh, chapters in this book. I'll do the, the, the chapter where she actually begins her flight towards freedom. And I'll read this chapter about the fugitive slave law she references the Fugitive Slave Law, the Fugitive Slave Act, on many occasions, which is why I read one of the Fugitive Slave Acts. So, um, this book is a very well-written, very detailed book, and I want to leave, I want to leave you to read it for yourself about her escape to freedom and there's some very uh, interesting you know interesting chapters like I'm if you thumb through this while she's in flight you'll see chapters called new perils and uh, the loophole of retreat Christmas festivities still in prison And just, I mean, many competition and cunning. She has very short chapters. Important era in my brother's life. New destination for the children. So she has very short, detailed chapters that I'm going to leave you to read for yourself. As I cover two more chapters. And my next few videos, 
will be without uh, my the actual video because I'm actually uh, moving so I don't have my room set up to take videos but I still want to address people who are watching my YouTube page so make make sure you subscribe I have a little over 500 subscribers. I would like to have more. I'm going to continue with uh, Black Literature, Black History. This is Jason Williams. Have a nice evening.